fantastic to see so many hundreds of you joining for another Action for Happiness live event. It's wonderful to see everyone greeting each other on the chat from all around the world and particular joy to have with us this evening, Lama Rod Owens. Lama Rod, it's fantastic to, to meet you and be together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, I'm really excited about our conversation. You are, of course, a, a Buddhist teacher and a best-selling author and activist. And I'm really excited to be exploring the ideas in your amazing book, Love and Rage, which is also the title of our event today. Uh, and in a moment, I'll hand over to you to maybe share a bit more about your own journey to kick us off. But before that, just to say to everyone joining us this evening, please do uh, engage on the chat as always, keeping it kind and supportive and friendly as you always do. There'll be plenty of chances to share some ideas and responses during the event. And also, Lama Rod will happily take some questions from the audience towards the end of our time together today. So please do use the Q&A function. Please vote up each other's questions if you see something you'd really love to have asked today. But Lama Rod, why don't we start with a bit about you and your own journey? What is it that's brought you to where you are today and particularly to this topic of, of love and rage and your, your work here? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, you know, I would say that I was very fortunate to be born curious with a lot of questions um, and a lot of curiosity about my own mind and my body. Um, and that really has shaped the journey that I've been on. You know, I am uh, originally from um, the North Georgia area um, here in the States, and this is the South. Um, and that culture really shaped me. I grew up in a very religious family, and my mother is a um, United Methodist minister. Uh, and I grew up in church. I grew up um, in the teachings of Christianity. But as I was growing up, I, again, had many questions about the world and about my mind and my body. And that um, really influenced me to, to read right and to explore of course i grew up before the internet right and so the internet wasn't a thing until i went to university you know so i read a lot i went to the library i really tried to understand everything i tried to understand the social world you know just all the things i was struggling with in terms of being black and queer um but i was also really interested in the spiritual world like what did it mean to be what what did it mean to be spiritual, right? What did it mean to, to have beliefs and to practice faith? Um, and so I, I, I took all of that, I worked with it, with it, I contemplated it. Um, as I moved through my adolescence into my teens, I started really getting involved um, in community service. Um, at university, community service really um, evolved into activism really because I began to understand that there were roots to the issues that I was really struggling with. And I had to get really creative and get really involved um, in addressing the roots um, of so many of the systematic issues like racism and homophobia and so forth that I was struggling with. And that actually became part of my religion, you know, was the work of, of helping, of being a service, of benefiting others through um, the work of activism and service, you know. Um, but of course, that opened the door to Buddhism, actually, you know, which is where it got real interesting <laughs> for me. Well, I'm sure more of that will emerge in our conversation, but that's lovely to have that context. And I, I, I wondered if we could maybe just begin by reflecting on where we are right now in the world at a time where we're still sadly dealing with this dreadful pandemic. We are uh, in many ways to the topic of this evening's event, feeling anger, many of us uh, at things we might perceive in the world around us as being unjust and wrong. But I think also situations in our own personal lives, the frustrations in our relationships and our working lives and just what it means to be human is part of our everyday existence. What's your take on where we're at as a human species and some of the reasons why this sort of balance between our anger and our joy perhaps is, is feels almost more important to explore now than ever before. 
Absolutely. Well, you know, I think that this is a moment of great change, right? This is part of an evolution of our cultures, of our societies. This is also a spiritual evolution. Um, one of the things that I deeply believe in is that great crisis or great struggle actually encourages us to change, to grow, right, to evolve. And when we talk about joy and struggle or joy and anger, it's about how all of these experiences are coming together and how we're being called to make sense of all of this. And when I say make sense, I really mean actually how are we being called to hold all of this complexity together, right? And not react to the complexity, but actually choose really beneficial, creative, and um, healing responses to this complexity right now. So I think in the world of happiness and well-being, where you know, my, my work is focused and where so many in this community have a real passion, there's a danger sometimes that we, uh, well, at least are perceived as sort of pursuing the good and perhaps pushing, pushing away some of the, the darker aspects yeah. of our human emotional experience. And I think what anyone who has developed a contemplative practice, whether that's in Buddhism or in other areas, tends to come to realize is that actually pushing away difficult emotions isn't really a path to a, a truly happy and fulfilling life. It actually in many ways creates problems. So I wonder before we talk more specifically about anger, could we reflect a little bit on difficult emotions uh, and what you, well, how, how you, you would describe you know, our need to, to listen to them? How, how would you describe that? Well, first of all, I think all of our difficult emotions are teaching us. They're actually full of a lot of data, right? And so if we have this tendency to push these difficult emotions away, we're, we're losing teaching, we're losing wisdom. Right. And so, of course, like what my deepest belief is that is that everything has to be embraced. Right. The light and the darkness. Right. You know, because. We have to understand that, like, difficult emotions are really based upon how we're relating to them. You know, we struggle with certain things and the things that we struggle with, we just label dark, <laughs> difficult. When in fact, like these these difficult experiences are trying to teach us like hopelessness, right, or sadness, right? You're, yeah, they're very um, draining, you know, emotional energies, but in hopelessness, in despair, I think they're teaching us how to live with much more open-heartedness. They're teaching us how to understand that we're not the only ones in the world who are experiencing um, really difficult uh, emotions, and that opens the door to compassion, right, where we say it's, it's me and so many other people in the world experiencing this, and may we all experience a kind of openness and, and liberation from these experiences. And I love the distinction you made a bit earlier on when you talked about rather than reacting sort of almost viscerally to these things, but to have a bit more of a choice. And yes. it's, it sometimes seems to me that it's quite easy to talk about choosing our conscious response, but actually in the moment when I'm feeling upset or ignored or you know, uh, there's mm -hmm. some injustice done to me, I'm, I'm not in that moment very good at choosing my response. It comes out almost instinctively. So is there a way that you've learned to sort of cultivate that, that space to allow us to choose? Well, primarily, we have to learn to experience everything that arises for us. So in the moment of being hurt, right, I am actually allowing myself to experience that discomfort, right? If we're not experiencing the discomfort, <laughs> we'll never be able to choose, you know, um, a way of being um, that seems to reduce violence instead of escalating it. So, so much of the violence that I see maybe in my daily life, if I happen to be out in the world, right? is from folks who are not experiencing what's arising for them, but are just habitually reacting to the discomfort, right? And that reactivity is about getting past the discomfort. It's not about experiencing it, letting it move through our experience, you know? And until we experience, we'll just always be reacting, right? And that those experiences just don't disappear. Like, like they only are able to, to be metabolized through experience. Right, but that experiencing has to be held with a lot of care, 
right? So that care means I'm being really gentle with myself, right? You know, so even with me and my daily life, right? You know, particularly over the past few days, yes, of course, there's so much, you know, a lot of like uncomfortable, right? Emotional experiences are arising for me because I'm also in a process of change and evolution where I'm having to let go, right? Of expectations of the things that I thought I needed and wanted, right? And so the only way for me to move through that is for me to really show up and experience the discomfort. And it's not fun. Actually, it sucks. Actually, I would rather be doing something else that's um, a lot more fun, you know? But I'm not actually engaged in this path because I want to have fun, you know? I'm engaged in this path because I want to be free from habitual reactivity to everything that arises. To do that, I have to experience. When I learn to experience everything, then over time, there's this experience of space that arises. Within that space, I touch my joy and my happiness, you know, and I also continue to be in a relationship to the discomfort. Yeah, we've had other speakers sharing with us that you can't really selectively numb human experiences. And if we try to numb the anger and the sadness and the pain, we also numb that potential for joy. So I think you're really reinforcing that point. Um, in a moment, I'd love us to turn to the audience and maybe ask people to share some of the things that are sources of anger for them. But maybe what we could just dwell for a moment on anger specifically, because obviously it's something you've written and thought about a lot. What's going on with anger and, and why does it matter? Yeah, well, anger is incredibly important, but so is everything <laughs> that we experience in terms of mental states. Um, and emotions, because again, they're helping us to understand really important parts of who and what we are. But in my work, you know, particularly anger is a secondary emotion, right? So it's not the main emotion. So if anger isn't the main emotion, then what's the primary experience then? And for me, the primary experience is hurt. You know, I experience hurt. Every being on this planet, all animals, and including plants, I would say, experience hurt, discomfort, right? And because we experience that, we want to take care of ourselves. Like we don't want to experience that, right? But we do. But often we don't know how to take care of ourselves in the moment. So between the hurt and our desire to take care of ourselves, there's a tension that arises. Right, And as long as we are not taking care of ourselves, that tension grows stronger and stronger. When we start getting in a reactive relationship with that tension, then that's when I say anger you know, arises. Anger is just my reactivity to the tension between being hurt and needing to take care of myself. So before we come to some of the practical ways we can take care of ourselves more, why don't we hold space for what people are feeling in terms of hurt? Maybe there's a, a reflection or something we could invite the audience to think about, to bring to mind something specific. How would you, how would you frame that? Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, I think that for many of us, it's quite easy to remember the last time that we were angry or pissed off, you know, you may be angry and pissed off right now. <laughs> you know? But, you know, I think it, it's important just, you know, just to reflect on the last time you felt anger, right? And what was, what was that experience like? How did you feel that experience in your body, right? What, what were the sensations, perhaps? What did it feel like in your mind, you know? And then once you you know, contact that, then you just want to go just a little deeper and to say, what brought about this experience? Like, what was happening? What's going on? And this experience may be something that happened in the moment, like there was a trigger, you know, someone said something hurtful to you, and that triggered this whole experience. Or maybe this anger is just coming from something that has always been an issue, like maybe not personal, but systematic, right? And so we can go deeper into that and say, you know what, something happened that was really uncomfortable, that was really hurtful. You know? let's, let's just take a moment to invite the audience. I've seen a couple of people doing this already. Um, if you feel able to and would like to, please just take a moment in a few words to share um, something that is a source of hurt or anger for you, either recently or as Nama Rod says, that's been there for some time. So 
Li Peng has sort of talked about frustration and anger with parents, uh, lack of assertiveness, mm -hmm. injustice, betrayal, finding out you've been cheated on, having to move home, feeling abandoned, incompetence, uh, exclusion, embarrassment, estrangement, anger at the government, misdiagnosis, rejection, political hypocrisy, disrespect, death of friends, uh, work pressure, losing parents, toxic manager, feeling unappreciated, grief. I I'm feeling slightly overwhelmed, but also really touched to see this list. How does that resonate with you, Lama Rod? I resonate with everything like this. We, we have these personal experiences and by us sharing in this way, we're all beginning to, to maybe understand that like these are common shared experiences, right? And so we're not alone. And this is an important part of the work of empathy and compassion is to realize that I'm not the only one who's struggling to be well, right? I am within a collective of people as we see globally, you know, who's experiencing this. So I don't feel so alone. You know, this is what, why this is so helpful. We can understand we're not alone. Yeah, I think that in itself is just really moving. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who's been brave enough to share something really personal there. It's, it's both overwhelming, but as you say, it's also really uniting, creates that sense of common shared humanity. We all struggle. It's okay to not be okay. So I wonder if we could build from this you know, real leaning into the difficult hurt, the anger and so on, and you talked about maybe learning to be a little bit more able to care for ourselves. Um, wh where would you go from, you know, once someone started to tune into these feelings, what's the next step? Mm -hmm. I think a really important step is to start telling ourselves that it's okay. Like, it's okay that I feel the way that I'm feeling. It's okay that I have survived these circumstances. You know, that I'm not necessarily a bad person, that what I've experienced isn't a judgment. Um, it's not, um, you know, uh, a sign that maybe I'm doing something wrong. It is actually just an experience of being human and living with other humans, you know, where we're all trying to get our needs met, right? And trying to take care of ourselves, but sometimes we don't know how to do that. You know, so there's going to be hurt. There's going to be misunderstanding. So that's my that's, that's my personal practice. It's just, just as much as possible, you know, just allowing myself to be gentle with myself, you know, not to judge myself and not to criticize myself, but to say it's okay. You know, it's okay that I'm hurting. It's okay that I'm angry. You know. I'm really glad that you said that phrase about having our needs met. It reminds me of a book I've been reading recently by an author called Alice Sheldon, who, who makes the point that almost all human behavior can be explained by people trying to meet their needs. And actually, when we see that in ourselves, we understand more about our drives and our motives and our feelings. But also when we realize that in others, we understand a bit more about what, what seems to be unfriendliness or disrespect or hostility is coming from somebody else trying to meet their needs, maybe in a, a flawed way. And so it feels like empathy is important here, not, not just for others, but for ourselves too. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. You know, and I think it's also really important for us to understand the difference between a need and a want, you know, and a lot of us are trying to get our wants met, right? which will lead to overconsumption and materialism, you know, and, um, and not really getting to often the needs. Like my needs are the things that help me to maintain my welfare, my mental health, my physical health, right? It helps me to, my needs are important because they help me to help other people, you know? Um, and that's how I really begin to understand my, need, my needs compared to my wants. It's okay to get things that we want, you know, but we have to understand that like when we overconsume, you know, that's not a need, you know. Or, or, or that what you're making me think is that our wants are sometimes a proxy for a deeper need that we haven't realized yet. So the reason I want to have the latest brand or the reason I want to 
do well at work is because I have a human need to feel valued and seen. Yes. And it's not really about what I'm wearing or whether I'm uh, a senior yeah. person in an organization. It's about does someone value me as a human being. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so help us with some practices that we can do to bring this. So you've, I think you've already made it really clear that just taking time to be aware of how we're feeling and noticing these difficult emotions and anger and, and hurt and so on, and, and recognizing that's okay and that we're not the only person, that's step one. Are there some sort of day-to-day -day practices that you use that help you then make more of that choice in how to respond? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I make a commitment to, to develop as much awareness as possible about what I'm thinking and what I'm saying and what I'm doing. Like these are the three aspects of how we show up our thinking, our speech and our like physical um, manifestation, our actions. You know, to use meditation, mindfulness, you know, is a good, good practice to develop a deep awareness to everything that I'm doing. So I'm not just unconsciously or habitually reacting, you know, to everything, you know. Um, and I try to, as I move through the world, um, do what I can to remain focused and not so distracted, you know, to, to understand how I am interacting with people, you know. Um, but, you know, mostly I am really, you know, as much as possible, asking myself what I need in the moment, which is a really important question. As much as possible, what do I need right now? You know, it could be as simple as I need a sip of water. <laughs> I need to take a break. I need to refrain from being on a screen. <laughs> you know? I need to take a walk. I need to be in silence, right? I need a snack, you know, because I, I have to get those needs met because if I don't, then I start entering into a habitual reactive relationship with everything. So I feel the tension of not getting my needs met. What I really love about that is those little nuggets you shared are very personal and they're also just really simple acts of self-care. But I know that you're also someone who practices compassion in a yeah. really deep way for others. How do those two things relate? How does the sort of looking after our own needs in that way, which some might say is, rather sort of self-focused. How does that link to then our ability to be a force for good in the world? Exactly. Well, you know, uh, selfishness is actually quite skillful, right? Because if we're really invested in trying to help others, then we also have to be really concerned with making sure that we have the resources in order to be of service to people, right? Um, compassion is the wish for everyone, all beings to be free from suffering. I can't really work to free people from suffering if I'm not investing in my own practice to be freed from my own discomfort and suffering. Matter of fact, if I'm not doing the work of self-compassion for myself, then I actually become a problem for others who I think I'm trying to help. You know, actually my compassion, when I'm not compassionate towards myself, my compassion for others therefore becomes a way of avoiding my own discomfort, right? And that becomes an emotional burden for those who I think I'm trying to help, you know, because I am just like actually trying to get them to help me instead by helping me to avoid what's coming up for me. You mentioned that mindfulness and meditation is part of your own practice. I know many in this community will be familiar with various forms of that. I know we don't have very long together this evening, but I wondered if maybe you could share with us just a couple of minutes of a, a reflection practice or something we can do just to tune in a bit more to what, what our needs are and how we're feeling right now. Is a, Could you guide us through a couple of minutes of a, a meditative practice? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So to begin with, you know, I really encourage you just to, to allow yourself to be in a physical position that feels appropriate for you. And you can begin by just noticing the weight of your body, making contact with your seat, or maybe noticing your feet contacting the floor. And allowing the seat or the floor under you to really hold you. 
I wonder if you can really trust that you're being held by the seat and the floor under you. And when you're ready, just allow yourself to shift your attention maybe into your mind, noticing thoughts and emotions. If you're working with emotions, you can name those emotions. You, know, you can say, oh, I am, there's anger or there's happiness, there's some sadness or there's joy. You can see everything that's happening in your mind uh, that that it's arising within your own mind, right? That this is happening in your experience. And to go further, I encourage you to maybe choose one of these experiences, one of these emotions you've identified. It doesn't have to be an uncomfortable emotion. It can be, you know, something pleasant, right? So choosing that experience and just allowing yourself to experience, you know, what does joy feel like? Or if you're working with anger, what does your anger feel like? Maybe in your mind, Maybe what are some physical sensations associated with these mental experiences? And in experiencing, we're just getting curious about sensations and feelings. We're not thinking about the experience. We're just allowing the experience to unfold for us. Just a few more moments of experiencing here. And to go just a little further, you know, we can begin to reflect how we're not the only people who are experiencing this in this moment, whatever it may be, that we're not the only ones. And allowing that, that reflection to really open, particularly our empathy, our concern for others, our sense of connectedness and belonging to a community of countless beings who are experiencing exactly what we're experiencing in this moment. And when you're ready to continue, particularly as we prepare to move out of the practice, I just encourage you to slowly beginning to let this experience go as an object of meditation and shifting your attention back to the weight of your body, making contact with the seat. Noticing the floor under you. And then when you're ready, just allowing the body to reawaken, right? Just doing some simple movements, some stretching, maybe some deep breathing to just 
release anything that feels heavy or tense. And then allowing our attention to come back into the space. Thank you, Lama Rod. That was a really moving uh, sense of connectedness to everyone here, actually, as well as to my own feelings. I'm sure others felt the same. Thank you. One of the criticisms, I think, of those of us that believe in contemplative practice, especially in the context of anger at social injustice, is the idea that maybe it's a bit passive for us to be kind and compassionate and empathetic, but actually not really changing anything. Mm -hmm. And you spoke earlier on about your own anger at issues like racism and homophobia. How have you find ways not only to change within, but change without, you know, to actually contribute to changing things that are wrong in the world that we want to see shift? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as to the, the use of kindness, I can be both direct and kind at the same time, that kindness isn't something that I'm using to bypass the situation. Kindness is an extension of how I feel about myself, you know? And I can extend that kindness even in the moment where I have to really articulate, you know, some kind of injustice or wrong that's happening, right? Um, for me, you know, just over the course of, of my life and my work, um, it's been so important for me to understand that it's actually my love, not my anger that creates change, right? And there have been so many great leaders who have emerged over, you know, our lifetime, right? Who have deeply embodied love, but also have embodied a fierceness and a directness, right? The fierceness and the directness can be actually supported by our anger. Our anger helps us to understand that there's something wrong, right? I am angry because something has happened, right? And my love is this deep wish for everyone to be safe, to have what they need. And that motivates me, right? I want everyone to be safe. I want everyone to be happy. I want everyone to have the resources that they need. I do not believe that anyone should be a victim of any system of violence, you know, systematic violence or even interpersonal violence. And that deep wish, that deep concern is love, right? And I don't have to like you to love you. Actually, I don't like a lot of people, quite honestly, <laughs> you know, but I try to love everyone, you know. And again, love is like everyone deserves to be free. Everyone deserves to be safe. It doesn't matter who you are. Right, you know, I may be really pissed off at you, right? But that doesn't mean that I want you to hurt as much as I hurt, you know, because I understand what hurting feels like, mm. right? If I understand that, then how can I wish that on anyone else? But I can actually wish for people to be, to be held accountable because accountability means that the harm that I'm creating is being disrupted. By interventions and not to, not to, yeah that, that yeah. idea that you can show love and still want to hold people accountable yeah. I, i'm always struck by a phrase that really hit me as a parent but i think is true of all beings but it says sometimes the people most in need of love show it in the least loving ways yes and when you, and when you see that as a need for love that's leading to behavior you can express that love and still say but that's unacceptable behavior uh, and so I think that's really why. So that's a lovely example of how you've chosen to respond to some of your own feelings in, in a, what I'd call a helpful way. I wonder, just before we come to questions from the audience, and there's some great questions already um, been asked, um, could, could we just turn back to what we asked the audience? Earlier on, we asked people to think about something that's making them feel angry. I wonder if we could maybe invite them to think about something helpful that, that they can do or has, that has come out of that awareness. Mm -hmm. is, is there some way you could maybe just sort of frame that for us before we ask people to share in the chat? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, when we become aware of our anger, we also become aware of our reactivity. So when I know that I'm pissed off, you know, then I can actually become aware of the ways in which I'm reacting to that energy that actually may create more harm, you know, for people, right? And so, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to disrupt the ways in which we escalate harm and violence 
because we actually don't know how to be in relationship to the anger. So again, it's the love. It's not just love for other people, <laughs> you know, that we're working with, it's love for ourselves. I love myself, therefore I want to feel safe. I want to feel resourced, right? And in the moment, I want to make choices to reduce violence against myself and others, right? And I think as to your earlier point, you know, we, you know, we, we, we can think about the ways in which we've created harm for others because we're not getting what we need in the moment and vice versa. We can think about interactions we've had, we've had with other people where it seems as if that other person that we're struggling with maybe aren't, hasn't gotten what they needed, you know? There are so many people around us who really, they haven't received the love and care that they've needed. And this is from a very early age, you know, for those, you know, uh, of us who are actively engaged in mental health, you know, uh, in psychology, we understand that adolescent development is a really um, delicate period of development. And if young people, adolescents aren't getting love and support and care, that can actually impact their development as adults. Oh, yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, so folks, wherever you are right now, if you would like to, again, please take a moment just to share something helpful that you can feel or do in response to those difficult feelings we shared earlier on. I've already seen some people sharing on the chat, you know, to let go of their anger, mm -hmm. to um, meditate, to show solidarity, to pause, um, to walk in nature, step back, to learn from the anger, to do housework instead, to remember that the other is hurting, to take a breath and walk away, to yoga, swim, walk my dog, engage and listen, apologize, scream, name the emotion, be present with my anger, grounding, music and dance, writing, gratitude list, listening to music, petting the cat, kicking the wall. Uh, what, a, what a lovely um, creative array of helpful responses. Singing, thinking positively, um, make a choice, take a joy break, dance, talk to myself, paint. I'm feeling really uplifted by this list. How does this sit with you? This is incredible. Yeah, these are, this is about creating a tool bag of, of resources. So I can just like rely on these, these, these resources in the moment that I feel overwhelmed by my anger. And I think it's important for us to reflect on these, these techniques and these resources as much as possible. The more we reflect, the more accessible they become for us in the moment when we need them. Thank you, everyone, who took a moment to share something there in the chat. That's, I think, back to Lama Rod's point that that sense of where not only do we have a shared experience of the difficult emotions, but actually we have a shared creativity and helpful ways to respond. Let's come to some of the questions from the audience. And again, folks, if you'd like to ask one, please use the Q&A function. And if you see a question you like, please give it a thumbs up and it will jump up the list. Beth has asked, could you please talk about how to sit with difficult feelings? and get through the stories that we tell ourselves about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, one of the first kinds of mindsets that we can adapt is to first just contemplate that it is a narrative. It is a story that we're telling ourselves. I mean, that's so incredible. It's been incredibly important for me in my training, right, to understand that, you know, and what also has really helped, again, is understanding that I'm not the only person in the world trying to do this work, you know, that I think we can feel quite isolated when we're sitting with difficult emotions, thinking that we're the only people doing it. In fact, there's so many people who are helping, you know, who are helping themselves, like, to, to, to embrace this for themselves. Um, Self-compassion, gentleness, care, you know, just like it's been, again, telling ourselves it's okay. Like this is what being human is about, is about having this complex mind and complex body with a range of experiences, you know? And my work is to simply understand and maybe, well, to, under, to understand and to, to create a sense of spaciousness and holding for everything that arises for me um, in my complexity. 
um, in my work, I offer um, different kinds of practices that support this work. Um, these practices are based on um, developing um, the experience of love and compassion for ourselves. Um, and that's been really quite important for me, you know, that I remember the love and care from other beings around me. And I can just really drink in that energy of care and which just helps me move through a lot of difficult experiences. Thank you. Uh, Diane has asked, how can I use my anger against injustice to fuel my action, but not burn others or myself? Mm -hmm. It's very delicate. That's a, a very thin line. And I've been a concern with that, you know, for most of, most of my life, you know, um, as an activist, you know, and particularly as an educator now um, within social justice spaces. And so it's important that we really, really, really dig in to this experience of love, you know, for ourselves and others. That's, this is gonna, love helps to create boundaries around our anger, you know? So it, it's like our, 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 our love monitors the expression of our anger because love is always about people being safe and being resourced, right? And the energy of anger can really help us to understand what work needs to be done, where the injustice is, and it can really motivate us to stay involved, but it's the love that is the long-term um, experience that keeps us connected to the well-being of others around us. And it helps us to understand what we should be doing in order to, de to decrease violence. Is there a particular practice you use to cultivate that love? I know a lot of people in the Buddhist tradition would use a loving kindness style right. practice or wishing of happiness for other beings or meta practice. Is there something like that that, that that you find particularly helpful to create that sense of love? Because it can be quite hard when we're angry actually to feel oh, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's one of the hardest things to do in the beginning. If you're new to this, like really connecting to love and the depth of, of anger. Um, for me, um, these kind of loving kindness practices are important. I use what are called benefactor practices. And a benefactor practice is just imagining that I am receiving deep love, care, and compassion from a benefactor um, that I love and trust to begin with, right? And doing that when you're not angry is actually how we sustain the practice when we are angry, you know? So it's, it's not always the best time to start a practice when you're like really consumed by something <laughs> really intense. The best time to practice is when you're not because you know you want to really get really familiar with how to open to this energy so it becomes automatic like when we're really lost in something you know but you know a, a basic practice that i do as well is this just remembering that people want what i want like maybe not maybe they don't understand that like the way that they're going about getting what they want or need is really that appropriate but like as you know, as you pointed out earlier in our conversation, yeah, you know, we we understand that like we're fueled by getting our needs met, you know. So I understand that, and so part of my work is to help people to understand, you know, the best ways to go about getting their needs met that doesn't just keep reproducing violence and harm, you know, for themselves and for others. You know. And I personally found the practices of nonviolent communication as another really valuable tool. So how can you express your needs and hear other people's needs in a way that doesn't fuel conflict? Um, Sarah's asked a really wise question. How do you persuade someone who habitually reacts with anger or hopelessness into being more mindful and compassionate when they just don't seem to feel these emotions or the need for them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the best way to do this is to embody what compassion, care, and gentleness looks like, right? So if we're in a relationship with someone who is really struggling to become aware of, you know, how they're showing up, my primary action is to just reflect back to them what this gentleness and care looks like. 
continually over and over and over again, right? You know, and not to say that I don't have boundaries because I do, you know, but those boundaries are actually an expression of kindness for myself and for someone else, you know, in the moment. I think the best way to teach people is to just to become the teaching itself. So people are watching you, you know, embody this, right? You know, instead of you just like talking about it, proselytizing, because I think that can get quite aggressive, you know, and annoying. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But when I'm just being myself and doing my practice and I'm, and just modeling what this looks like, people can see that it actually works and they'll be much more convinced to engage. And so people will often come to you if you're embodying these techniques and ask you what you're doing. You know, it definitely that happens to me quite often. Like, what are you doing? You know, because you should be really pissed off now, but you're not. You know, like, tell me, you know, what's happening? Because people, again, want to be free from suffering. So if we have a sense that someone's doing something to get free, then we're going to gravitate towards that person and the practices, right? So it's more about being the change, as Gandhi would supposedly have said, rather than preaching the change exactly. and embodying it. It strikes me that as I look around, particularly in the toxic world of social media, that a lot of people express their anger through a, a, a really visceral critique of the other side, whoever the other is. We have this in-group, we're part of this tribal instinct we all have as human beings, and we see the out-group as a threat, but actually we dehumanize that other group. Mm. We make them evil, we make them mm. malicious. We don't see their needs, we see their hatred. Yes. That, that feels really hard to break, and especially as we get more and more polarized yeah. People in our tribe are the good guys. People in the other tribe are, are inherently evil. How do we get beyond that? Well, I think it's it's about understanding complexity, right? You know, that someone just isn't a bad person, that, you know, that they're seeing and doing something because of very specific reasons, right? And I wonder if we can do the work of trying to empathize with those reasons, you know, and also beginning to understand that like we're not we're not necessarily right, you know, because the people we say that are on the other side, they're also saying the same thing about us, you know. So how do you how do you get to a point of determining who's right or wrong, you know? And I think that could be a rabbit hole that we fall into and we don't get anywhere. But I think the best way to to really address this is to say that like we all have these needs and these wants, and we're trying to figure out how to meet them, right? And I wonder how we can actually develop this deep empathy that says that like, you know, your life and all the circumstances of your life is actually shaping how you show up right now. And can we get curious about those circumstances? You know, but can we get curious about our own circumstances that has deeply shaped how we show up in the world, right? Because it's not about us and them, it's just, it's, it's us, it's all of us together, all trying to figure out how to be happy and to suffer less. Lama Rod, you made a point earlier on about some anger being really deep rooted, coming from maybe early experiences or lifelong mm -hmm. situations. Sandy B has asked an interesting question. How do we handle long-term resentment which for me stems from anger, but turns into resentment. I've worked with forgiveness, but I see myself still holding on to resentment, which seems to cancel the forgiveness. Clearly yeah. in this case, something that's been going on for many, many years. Yeah. Well, a lot of this is, I think, related to the ways in which we're still struggling to experience love for ourselves. It's the love that offers us the energy and the resources to let go of hurt, you know, and resentfulness, right? Um, and again, that takes a deep practice of allowing ourselves to be loved by those around us, right? And that gives me, particularly in my practice, a lot of safety to start letting go, you know, and saying, you know what, it's, it's okay. Like, it's okay. You know, we're not, we're not trying to forget anything. We won't forget, right? But we can let go of the ways in which we feel, feel hostile, where we feel captive and hostage, held hostage, you know, by our own anger, you know. 
Because, well, you know, and I would just say this other piece is that we don't want to let go because we've built a sense of identity around, of our, around our resentment and our anger. We say, well, this is who I am. You know, if I let go of this anger or this resentment, then I actually have to figure out who I am now. And that can be quite scary, you know, because we've gotten quite comfortable in the resentment and the anger. It, it's really challenging, but thank you for encouraging us to challenge ourselves in this way. Caprice has asked, is there a practice you use or recommend to help keep the body, I guess our physical being in a state of being able to sit with these difficult emotions without feeling overwhelmed or sort of feeling the need to react or protect ourselves? Because I, I guess it can be quite, you know, you talked about, about tuning into and noticing these feelings, but sometimes that can be really overwhelming. Well, I think what's really important is movement. Like we're allowing our bodies to move because when we move, we're actually learning how to move this energy in the body around, right? Because when we're just, you know, this idea of sitting, you know, really this connotation is like, I'm just gonna sit still and hold this. Well, the body, you know, has to be a movement to move energy, right? And so just having some, some you know, movement, simple movement practice as you're trying to process through difficult emotions is quite important. You know, for me, yoga, you know, I, I practice and study and teach yoga and that's been an incredible uh, practice for me, you know, particularly when I add the breath to movement and practice, it, it's really quite transformative and I can just really move through a lot of energy that feels really heavy and solid like anger or, or, or despair. Um, tomorrow when we send a follow-up to everyone who's been involved in this event today we'll, we'll share links to some of your um, great resources and, and and ways people can get involved in your work Lama Rod I also just wanted to pick out something I saw in the chat just now from Libby who shared a recommendation of a book called The Choice by Edith Eager which is a book I've read and found incredibly moving she had the most horrific experience in a concentration camp in in Second World War and it's a really amazing example I think of what you've been explaining this evening about how to get beyond resentment and make positive choices while still leaving space for all that hurt that's there so thank you Libby for reminding us of that and thank you to everyone actually who shared ideas and resources in the chat today it's been really wonderful. Lulu has asked uh, how do we how can I avoid hurting someone when I'm angry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the best thing to do is to walk away. <laughs> um, to I, when I feel as if I lose awareness around, you know, what I'm reacting to, then for me, that's, that's out of being out of control, right? And if I'm out of control, I have to refrain from a situation if I can't, right? And that means like, letting go of speaking, maybe walking away, saying something like, you know, I can't communicate anymore because if I do, I'm gonna create harm. Um, that refraining is like incredibly important. That's the choice that we have to make when we feel as if we're, just, we're gonna escalate violence, right? You know, and then, you know, another piece of this was actually goes back to the, the previous question about resentment and anger, you know, that kind of, we struggle with letting go or refraining in the moment because we think that our anger is how we're gonna get back at someone. So it's this kind of very subtle, you know, belief that this is my revenge on the person who's hurt me. I'm just gonna be really angry. I mean, be really resentful. But often that experience is actually hurting us the most. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that we're angry, you know, and resentful towards that actually maybe don't even know <laughs> that we're angry and resentful towards them. So it's really not getting back, it's actually hurting us, right? And this is why we're really working hard to understand how to let go. But we're also understanding at the same time how to channel that energy into accountability, right? And that accountability means that like, I want someone to understand how they've hurt me and I want, to explore ways that this person, you know, um, can stop hurting me or others, you know, maybe in the same way. That's what, that's what we're aiming towards in mm. terms of accountability. We're 
that, that's so wise. Thank you. And we're, we're sadly running out of time. I'm not sure we'll have time to do this one justice, but I wanted to read it out because it actually really resonates with me. I think it's a problem I have myself, actually. Colette has said, my husband wants me to be happy all the time. And if I get sad or angry, I think he feels it has to do with him and it doesn't. Yeah. What can I do to help him understand it's OK to have other feelings besides being happy all the time? I find myself burying my feeling for fear of having him feel insecure. Yeah. I really resonate with that. I'm sure I have yeah. um, made it hard for others to share their difficult feelings in that same way at times. It's an important point, I think. Well, this is a really, I think, very important topic. And I know we're running out of time. But I would just briefly say that, like, it's important for us to understand that everything isn't about us, right? And so if we're in a relationship with someone, we have to you know, keep communicating that what I feel and what I experience has nothing necessarily to do with you. You know, that there are just experiences that I'll have. And I think that it's important for us to do this incredible work of not centering ourselves in other people's experiences that we, that have nothing to do with us, right? And that's a sign of the ways in which we need certain kinds of care and love when we're always centering ourselves in other people's experiences. You know, and of course, it's just communication. This is how we work through these difficult relationships, just like communication, communication, this isn't about you. Like, this isn't about you. Well said. Um, this all links really beautifully, actually, to Action for Happiness is theme for this month. As many in this community know, we have monthly themes. Our December theme, Do Good December, is all about kindness and bringing a bit more empathy and compassion into the world, to ourselves, but also to others around us at this time of year when many are sadly wanting to be connected and loved and together, but perhaps may not have that opportunity. And of course, at a time, as we said at the start, many are still really struggling with the situations we find ourselves in. So um, if you haven't already seen this, we have our, our December kindness calendar, which uh, is available at actionforhappiness.org. This is the um, actual calendar itself, which is packed full of little joyful actions you can do to brighten up other people's days. This is an idea that's been going for sort of four or five years now, and over 30 million people have used these action calendars now. So please continue to get involved and support and spread the word about ways we can create a bit more compassion in the world this December. But also what's already been shared in the chat here and we'll send again tomorrow is some fantastic resources from Lama Rod's website and that his team have shared with us. Is there anything you'd like to particularly draw people's attention to around next steps, Lama Rod? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I guess next steps would be just to, to start developing a deep intention and aspiration to experience your anger and to also experience the hurt beneath the anger that your anger is always pointing you back to the hurt and to take that seriously. It's been such a pleasure connecting with you. You shared so much wisdom. I feel very moved and I'm very grateful to everyone in this community who's shared such wise thoughts and has contributed today from all around the world, but particularly gratitude from all of us to you, Lama Rod, for what you've shared today and also all of your great work. I look forward to carrying on the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.